and this video is the first in a series of videos on Vinberg's algorithm and Katz-Moody algebras. Um, it's an expanded version of the Vinberg lecture I gave a couple of days ago. Um, this is the first video in the series and will be mostly on Vinberg's paper. Um, I plan to have later videos covering topics like John Conway's reflection group in 25 dimensions and discuss uh, some Katz-Moody algebras and automorphic forms related to it. Um, so I'll start by introducing Vinberg's paper. So um, Vinberg's paper um, comes is, is one of the papers in this book here. Um, I'll actually try and remember to put a link to this book since you can get it online these days. And his paper is on, it's this one, on arithmetical discrete groups and Lobachevsky space. So Lobachevsky space is another name for hyperbolic space. And I somehow came across this paper many years ago and I noticed in the back of it there are these um, really intriguing diagrams. So if, if you look at these diagrams, well, these are just the Coxter diagrams of finite reflection groups that I'll discuss briefly later. But down here, um, there are some new diagrams I hadn't come across before. Um, and you wonder what on earth they are. And there are some even stranger ones here. You see the, the, these, these sort of rather impressive, um, mysterious circular diagrams. So what I'll try and do in this first lecture is explain um, what these diagrams in Vinberg's paper is. And so somehow there's something very compelling about doing deep high level mathematics just by drawing these tiny little doodles on a piece of paper. Um, so I'll, I'll start by just summarizing um, or reviewing some basic material about reflection groups. So, so here's an example of a reflection group. What we do is we take three mirrors. So you think of these as being mirrors in the plane. Here, here the mirrors are just one dimensional lines because I'm working in the plane rather than uh, in three dimensional space. And if you take a point here, um, you can reflect it in these mirrors. You get a better color that doesn't really show up. If you take this point and reflect it, you get another point here. And then if you reflect it, you get points here and here and here and here. So you get a sort of kaleidoscope um, um, effect. And this um, reflection group can be described as follows. What we do is we take a fundamental domain. So, so, so this region here is called a fundamental domain. And what this means is that every point in the plane um, is congruent under some series of reflections to a unique point in this fundamental domain. For instance, this point here is congruent to this point in the fundamental domain. Um, and the, um, the, the, the mirrors that bound this fundamental domain are called the simple roots, or rather they correspond to the simple roots. They're not quite the simple roots. Um, strictly speaking, the simple roots are little vectors um, orthogonal to these um, these hyperplanes. So, so I really ought to call this the simple root, but sometimes call the hyperplane the simple root. Um, uh, and Coxeter found a very neat way of drawing pictures of reflection groups by just drawing what is called the Coxeter diagram. And the Coxeter diagram works like this. What you do is you draw a point for each simple root. So these points correspond to simple roots. So there are two simple roots, um, and therefore there are two points in the Coxeter diagram. And you indicate the angle between these simple roots by drawing various lines between these two points. For instance, if there's an angle of pi over 3, or 60 degrees, you indicate this by drawing a single line between these points. Um, so here's another reflection route. This time I'm just going to take two mirrors that are orthogonal to each other. And here a fundamental domain looks like this. And the Coxeter diagram of this looks like this. There are two um, simple routes here and here. So there are two points in the Coxeter diagram. And there are 
the angle between them is pi over 2 and we, you indicate this by drawing no lines between these points. Um, there's actually a slight difference between Coxter diagrams and Dinkin diagrams. Um, so um, the, the, the difference is as follows. The Dinkin diagrams keep track of of lengths of the root. So if we've got a um, a mirror here, then the Coxeter diagram just keeps track of the mirror, but there's also a, a root perpendicular to it, or orthogonal to it, and the Dinkin diagram sort of has some extra information telling you what the length of this vector is. Um, and secondly, um, these roots must lie in a lattice. Um, um, so an example of a reflection group whose roots don't lie in a lattice is if you take um, this reflection group. So here um, I've got five planes and you, you, you get a little reflection group with ten elements. And if you draw the roots um, orthogonal to these, um, you, you, you can you find that the roots don't lie in a lattice, which is a, a lattice is some sort of regular array of points in a plane like this. So if you take the linear combinations of these roots, they, they're, they're dense in the plane. Um, so um, there are um, three sorts of reflection groups um, that we're going to be uh, concerned with because there are three different sorts of geometry so um, you know there is spherical geometry and there is Euclidean geometry and there is hyperbolic geometry and um, you can classify the reflection groups in spherical or Euclidean geometry um, there are actually some rather nice pictures of spherical reflection groups um, so um, here are some old pictures in in the book by uh, Klein and Fricker on um, elliptic modular functions and um, this is the 19th, 19th century German very famous German book and um, recently it was translated into English by Arthur Dupre so if you want to get it I think the AMS is now selling the English translation so Here's an example of a spherical reflection group. Um, there, there it's been sort of projected into a plane. And um, here's a, another example of the icosahedral spherical reflection group. Um, you can even make three-dimensional models of the icosahedral reflection group if you want, and they, they look like this. Anyway, the spherical reflection groups are classified as follows. They have this rather unimaginative notation of a n b n or c n d n e6 e7 e8 f4 g2 and then there's also i n h3 and h4 and um these ones i'm not going to be interested in because these are these don't correspond to dinkin diagrams they they only correspond to coxter diagrams and here um there are two Dinkin diagrams, B, N, and C, N, which correspond to the same Coxeter diagram. So th th there are some slight technical differences. If you want to see what the diagrams look like, um, instead of writing them all out, I'm just going to show you the pictures of them in Vinberg's paper. So, so here is a list of the um, is, is a list of the Coxeter diagrams um, for um, spherical geometry. Um, the classification of um, Euclidean reflection groups is very similar. So um, here's an example of a Euclidean reflection group. What I can do is I can just take a lot of mirrors that look like this in the plane and you see there's a fundamental domain here and now if you look at one of these points of the fundamental domain um, you notice um, what you're getting if you just look at the six 
three hyperplanes through this point, you're just getting the um, spherical reflection group that we had in the previous, um, that we had a couple of pages earlier. Um, so there's quite a close correspondence between spherical and Euclidean reflection groups. It's not quite one-to-one -one because, um, you know, I could take a different vertex, for example, um, and in this case all three vertices give us the same spherical reflection group, but, but sometimes it's a bit more complicated. So um, um, for each spherical reflection group, you tend to get one or two Euclidean reflection groups, or sometimes you get no Euclidean ones. If you want to see pictures of the Euclidean reflection groups, they were also given by Vinberg, and here's a, here's a picture of the Euclidean reflection groups. And you can see they look quite similar to the spherical ones. Um, so um, here, for example, is a spherical reflection group called F4, and here is a corresponding Euclidean reflection group called F4 with a twiddle on it. And you see that this diagram is the same as that one, except you've added this extra node at the end. And, and um, all the others are kind of similar. You, you, you get a Euclidean one by adding one extra node to a, to a spherical reflection group. Um, uh, Klein and Fricker also have some uh, a few pictures of some of the Euclidean reflection groups, if I can find them. Um, so, so here are Klein and Fricker's pictures of three of the Euclidean reflection groups. Um, um, so I, I'm just going to give two examples of Euclidean or no, sorry, of spherical reflection groups that I'm going to need later. First of all, we can take the lattice I n. Um, the lattice I n is just the same as z to the n, so it's all vectors m1, m n, with m i just an integer, and it has the obvious inner product, so the norm of a vector, that's the square of the length, is just going to be m1 squared and so on, plus m n squared, so you just do the, the most obvious thing. Um, and then if you look at the, um, you, you, you can ask what are the, um, what are the simple roots of this? Well, first of all, we have to figure out what the roots are. Well, a root is going to be a vector v, so a vector r, such that reflection in the orthogonal complement of r takes i n to i n. And what does reflection do? Well, it takes a vector v to v minus 2r v over v v times v. So it's quite easy to check. I mean, this is obvious for vectors that are orthogonal to r, and it's also obvious for r, so it's true for all vectors. Um, and if you notice, we want this to be um, in the lattice we first started with, and this will always be true provided um, this bit here is an integer. Um, so um, we really want v v to be equal to 1 or 2. Um, for more complicated lattices it's possible to have reflections where, where v v has norm greater than 2, but I'm, I'm mostly going to be doing um, what are called unimodular lattices, which means the volume of a fundamental um, domain is just one, and these are the easiest ones to deal with. So um, we can now try and find the uh, roots of I n. So we just want vectors of norm 1 or 2. Um, well, there are some obvious vectors of norm 1. We could just take a lot of zeros and then have one vector that's plus or minus 1. So these have norm 1. Uh, next we could have vectors of norm 2. So we take two entries that are plus or minus 1 and these give norm 2. Um, and now we can ask what are the simple roots of a fundamental domain? And this isn't terribly difficult to work out. So in, in two dimensions the reflections look like this and you can see for a fundamental domain there are going to be two 
um, roots like that. And in general, the roots look like this. We, we, we can take a norm one root, which looks like that. And then um, a norm two root that looks like this. And another norm two root that looks like this. And we go all the way down to this root here. And if you draw the corresponding Coxter diagram or Dinkin diagram, rather, it looks like this. We draw a point for each simple root and all of these ones have inner product minus one, which means we draw them by a single line. And these ones have um, the angle between them is now pi over four, which we indicate by drawing a double line. And um, a Dinkin diagram, you draw a little inequality sign to point towards the smallest root. So the the um, Dinkin diagram of this um, is is just a line with with a line of points with it with uh, something funny going on at one end of it. Um, so uh, the, the other example we're going to use is the famous E8 lattice. So the E8 lattice consists of the following vectors. It consists of all points M1 up to M8 um, in eight dimensions with either all the mi in z or all the mi in z plus a half. So we have one of these two conditions and we need an extra condition that the sum of the mi is even. So um, um, roughly speaking this condition throws away half the vectors and then this condition adds in the same number of vectors again. So this is sort of the same size as i to the n, um, except it's got this following extra property that the norm of all vectors is even. Um, you notice this if you take a vector where all the entries are a half, say a half up to a half, then the norm is a half squared times eight, which is two, which is now even. So um, this is something funny that happens whenever the dimension is divisible by eight. You can do this sort of trick and um, the norm of all vectors is even. If the dimension wasn't divisible by eight, then the norm of this vector would, would not be an even even number. So we can ask how many how many roots does it have? Well, there are two sorts of roots. First of all, we can take um, two entries that are plus or minus one, and you can see there are 112 of these. Or we can take plus or minus a half or up to plus or minus a half. And there are 128 of these. Um, you might think there are 256 because there are eight choices for sign, but then we've got this condition that the sum of the vectors has to be even, which, which cuts down half of them. So altogether there are 240 um, um, simple roots. And the, um, the Coxter diagram or Dinker diagram looks like this. So you take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vectors like that, and then you have one extra vector there, and the vectors are like this. This one here is the could be the vector one zero minus one zero minus one one zero. Um, this one could be the vector zero minus one one, and and this one has a lot of plus or minus a half in it, which I can't be bothered to work out where all the where all the signs go, and you can fill in the rest for yourself. Um, we can also ask what is the corresponding Euclidean reflection group, which looks like the spherical E8 reflection group, except you add in um, translations of the lattice. And this is the effect that you add in one extra simple root onto the end like this. So, so, so this is the Euclidean E8 lattice, and this is the uh, spherical E8 lattice. And um, this diagram contains an awful lot of information. In fact, you can do some quite difficult calculations just by putting your finger over nodes. For instance, we can take the following question. Suppose you take the E8 Lie algebra, whatever that is, something with corresponding to this, and ask what subalgebras does it have? 
Well, you can find subalgebras of the E8 Lie algebra, or at least some of them, by, by taking this f 8 Dinkin diagram and just putting your finger over various points. So if I put my finger over this point here, I see I've got a line of eight points, which is the AN Dinkin diagram. And the AN Dinkin diagram is just the Dinkin diagram with the Lie algebra SL9 of R. So we've discovered that Lie algebra SL9 of R is contained in the Lie algebra E8 just by, you know, just by this trivial operation of hiding a point. And similarly, you can find other subalgebras of the E8 by putting your finger over other points. For instance, here we've got, that's actually the E6 Dinkin diagram. This is the A2 Dinkin diagram. That gives you another subalgebra of the E8 Lie algebra. So, so this, this, this diagram contains an enormous amount of um, high-level information slightly hidden in it. Um, another example of a hyperbolic... So oh, no, now, now we move on to hyperbolic reflection groups. Um, so let's have some examples of this. Well, first of all, here's a rather nice picture in, in Klein and Fricker's book. Um, so this is the, this, this is the fundamental... Uh, this this is this is part of a um a hyperbolic reflection group in the hyperbolic plane um all these curved lines here are are really straight lines in hyperbolic space um they sort of look curved because if you embed hyperbolic space into euclidean space there's the, you don't really have enough room to do it properly so the, the straight lines end up curved due to some sort of optical illusion um, the fundamental domain for this reflection group consists of these little triangles here um, with sides that are pi over 2, pi over 3, and pi over 7. Um, um, the artist Escher um, also uh, used hyperbolic space in some of his work. Um, after, I think he discovered this by talking to Coxeter. So here's a typical example of one of Escher's pictures of hyperbolic space, where he's sort of tessellated hyperbolic space with a lot of fish. And again, if you look carefully, you can see there are some reflection hyperplanes. So there's a sort of white line here going through all the fish. And if you look very carefully, you can see that's a sort of, um, you, you, you can sort of reflect in that. Um, the, the picture looks as if it's getting as if the fish are getting very, very small near the boundary, but they're not really. That, that's just a sort of another optical illusion. And, and, and all, you should think of all these fish as really being the same size. And um, it looks as if it's getting you know, really hot and crowded around here, but it's not at all. It, uh, uh, again, it's just, uh, it's just actually really no more crowded down here than it is up there. Um, <clears throat> Another example of a hyperbolic reflection group, um, which you've seen if you've covered modular forms, is, is the group GL2 over the integers. So this is just the set of all points A, B, C, D. Um, this is a two by two matrices. So A, B, C, D are integers, and A, D minus B, C is equal to plus or minus one. And this acts on the upper half plane H, um, which consists of all complex numbers tau, x plus i, y, with y greater than zero. And it acts by a, b, c, d, tau equals a tau plus b over c tau plus d, except you've got to be a little bit careful because tau might end up having negative imaginary parts. So what we need to do is identify tau with its complex conjugate. And then you get an action of GL2z on the upper half plane. And you can ask, what does a fundamental domain look like? And it looks like this. Um, what you do is um, you take, so this is going to be the real line, and this is going to be the, the complex line. And then you take a little circle like this. And then you take the point a half and you draw a vertical line up here. And the fundamental domain now looks like this. And if you want to know what its Coxeter diagram looks like, it, it again looks like this. So there are 
three um, faces of this fundamental domain. So we have three points. And look at the angles. The angles here are pi over 2, pi over 3, and there's something funny going on here. Um, so um, we, the, um, we draw an angle between these. We draw a single line between these because because that's there's an angle of pi over three. I, I should say which of these points corresponds to um, which point. Well, um, this wall here is going to correspond to this point, um, and this wall here will correspond to this point, and this wall will correspond to that point. And now we've got to do something about this angle here, and there's really no good convention for it. Sometimes people indicate it by drawing a very thick line like this. Um, and other people do things like draw a double line or something. There's no fixed convention. So, so here the points meet at infinity. Um, um, sometimes you can get um, mirrors in hyperbolic space that don't meet even at infinity and then you need to think of something even more complicated to draw here and again there, there, there's really no good convention for this. Um, this reflection by the way corresponds to taking tau goes to minus one over tau, a very famous Jacobi's imaginary transformation. Um, um, by the way if you've done modular forms you've probably seen a slightly different fundamental domain that looks a bit bigger. Um, so if you add in this, you, you, the fundamental domain for SL2 looks like this. So SL2z just as AD minus BC equals plus 1. Um, the problem is that the fundamental domain for SL2z is, is not the fundamental domain of a reflection group. The, um, the, 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 these walls here are not reflections for SL2z. So if you want reflection groups, you have to use GL2z rather than SL2z in hyperbolic space. Um, in high dimensions, there turn out to be absolutely massive numbers of examples, um, um, even in dimension two. Um, well, what I'm going to do is, is look at a particular series of examples studied by, by Vinberg, which are given by automorphism groups of Lorentzian lattices. So let me explain what these are. So Lorentzian lattice is a lattice, except instead of being contained in Euclidean space Rn, I'm going to have it contained in Lorentz space Rn, 1. So this consists of all the points x1 up to xn, and then I put a vertical line before xn plus 1 to warn you there's something different going on. And the norm is going to be x1 squared all the way up to plus xn squared minus xn plus 1 squared. So you need to pay careful attention to this minus sign here, which makes everything a little bit weird. Um, by the way, there are two conventions for Lorentzian space. You can also use R1, n, where you have one plus sign and n minus signs in the metric. And physicists are divided into two groups of people who won't speak to each other, one of whom uses this convention and the other of whom uses this convention, um, because this is, of course, the um, space-time in special relativity. Um, I'm going to use this convention because it's a little bit easier when you're talking about lattices because it will make various lattices Euclidean. Um, in fact, if you go further into the theory, you find there are very strong reasons for using this convention instead. Um, and unfortunately, this means I constantly get confused about which convention I'm using. So um, there are probably going to be a few sign errors later on in the talk. Um, so how does this tie up with reflection, hyperbolic reflection groups? Well, let's draw a picture of Lorentzian space. Well, what you do is you draw a picture of the vectors v with v, v equals zero. And these form a famous double cone. So this is the light cone. If you're doing special relativity, these are the, these are the vectors that are um, in 
in momentum space that light travels along. And then we can have vectors r with r squared greater than zero, and these are space-like. So these sort of something to do with points of space. And then we have um, vectors of negative norms. So suppose I take the vectors of norm um, minus one. So these, the vectors of norm minus one are going to form a, a two-sheeted hyperboloid. So there's one sheet up there and the other sheet down there. And what you do is you throw away one of these sheets and fix this sheet here. And it turns out to be a copy of hyperbolic space Hn. And um, the metric on hyperbolic space is very easy. You just take the, uh, the, the, the metric of Euclidean space, except it's a kind of funny... Lorentz metric, where, 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 where you have a minus sign here, and just restrict it to this hyperboloid, and that, that, that gives you a, a nice positive definite Riemannian metric, and that just makes this into a hyperbolic space. The other nice thing is if we take a vector v of positive norm here and look at the um, hyperplane orthogonal to it so we get some sort of hyperplane here so this is going to be r perp then this is this is a mirror we can reflect in it and this gives us a reflection of hyperbolic space um, um, and we want it to preserve the lattice so we, we usually want r squared to be one or two by the way, there's a funny thing you can do. Um, what happens if you take r squared equals minus 1 or minus 2? Well, the formula for reflection still works, but what it does is it takes this copy of hyperbolic space to this other copy of hyperbolic space. So it doesn't quite give you a reflection of hyperbolic space. What, what, what it gives you is, is, is a sort of funny sort of automorphism of hyperbolic space where you where you fix a point and... Um, kind of invert in, in, in that point, map, map, map everything to minus itself. Um, anyway, the, um, these sorts of um, involutions give you reflections and these ones don't, although they're still quite interesting. Um, and we can ask, what is the automorphism group of L? Um, well, what is L? L might be, for example, um, the lattice. Um, uh, it, it, it might be the lattice I n comma one, which consists of all points m one, m n, m n plus one, with m i in the integers, and the norm, of course, is m one squared plus m n squared minus m n plus 1 squared. Um, so this will, um, and the automorphism group is, it, it has a reflection group inside it. And this reflection group has some sort of Coxeter diagram. Or rather, actually, I should really call it a thinking diagram. And um, we can also look at automorphisms of the Dinkin diagram. And in fact, we get a semi-direct product of, uh, of the reflection group and the automorphisms of the Dinkin diagram. And this is almost the same as the automorphisms of I n comma one. It's it's not quite the same. For instance, there's a there's a factor of two coming from the fact that the automorphism minus one. Um, um, also acts on i n, but um, the, the point is, if you find the reflection group and the Dinkin diagram, you've pretty nearly found the automorphism group of i i n comma one. Um, well, there's a second lattice that Vinberg examined, which is the lattice. Um, this is two i's indicating that it is an even lattice and this is constructed in a similar way to what we did for the e8 lattice so we're going to take m1 up to mn mn plus 1 
um, with all the mi in z or all the mi in z plus a half and we also want some of the mi to be even um, and this works if n is congruent to 1 modulo 8 and if n is congruent to 1 modulo 8 the norm are always even so this is this is called an even lattice because the norm of every vector is even um, so what Vinberg did in his paper that we're going to go through is work out the automorphism groups of these two lattices for certain small values of n um, so to do this he used Vinberg's algorithm So what's Vinberg's algorithm? Well, well, Vinberg's algorithm is very simple in principle. What you do is you, you take hyperbolic space. I'm going to draw hyperbolic space as a, as a disk, as in Escher's picture. And I'm going to take a fundamental domain. So here are three reflections. And here's a fundamental domain. Um, and what Vinberg's algorithm does is as follows. First of all, you pick a point P in the fundamental domain. And now, um, so step one is you pick P. Two, we find the um, walls of the fundamental domain in order of the distance from p and that's it that, that, that that's more or less uh, what Vinberg's algorithm is of, of course there are some details to fill in like how do you find the walls um, in order of their distance from p and for this you need the key point the angle between walls is always at most pi over 2 and what this means is if you're finding the walls um, in, in terms of distance from P, suppose you found walls A1 up to An, then this gives you a constraint on An plus 1. So, so you have to kind of use these constraints to narrow down the possibilities for the next wall. Um, the reason why the angle between the walls is at most pi over 2 can be seen if, uh, suppose you've got two walls that look like this and suppose you've got an angle here which is bigger than pi over 2 well if it's bigger than pi over 2 then there's going to be another wall like that um, which means that um, this wasn't really an angle of the fundamental domain um, so so that's what Vinberg's algorithm is we're just going to find all the walls in order of the distance remembering that the angle is at most pi over 2. Now let's translate this. Um, let, let's look at Vinberg's algorithm for lattices. So that was Vinberg's algorithm for hyperbolic space. We've now got to translate this into the language of lattices. So let's see what happens. Well, so here's our Lorentzian lattice and here's its light cone. And we've got to pick a point P. Um, well, Lorentzian space, sorry, hyperbolic space is going to be, say, the norm minus one vectors. And what we're going to do is we want to pick a point P in here. And this is just going to be a vector, vector P, with P squared is less than zero. So it's going, we have to pick some time-like vector. And we then need to find the reflection hyperplanes. Well, as we saw in the previous slide, the reflection hyperplane is just going to correspond to a picking a point R with R squared greater than zero. And of course, we want, in fact, we want R squared equals one or two because we're working in a, in a unimodular lattice. And now we want to pick them in order of the distance of P from R. So what's the distance from 
he, who, or perp. Well, I don't really care what the exact formula for the distance is. The key point it is that it increases with um, this thing here. First of all, we normalize R so that it has norm 1. And then you just take its inner product with the vector P. And as I said, um, there's a formula for the hyperbolic distance involving this, which I don't really care about. All we need to know is that the um, distance increases with this vector V. So what we're going to do is we're going to find all the reflection hyperplanes by picking points R in increasing order of this value here. And now, what's the condition that the hyperplanes have angle less than equal to pi over 2? Well, this turns out to be the condition that R1, R2 have inner product less than or equal to 0. So all the conditions of Vinberg's algorithm can be written very neatly in terms of the uh, of this inner product of Lorentzian space. Um, so um, let's see how this works for um, I N one. So step one is we need to pick our vector p and we're just going to take p to be the most obvious possible vector of negative norm which is 0 0 0 1 so p squared is minus 1 and next we find the roots with rp equals 0 and this is just going to be the reflection group of i n um, and notice we actually have to make a sort of choice here because we need to pick one of the fundamental domains containing p which is like picking one of the fundamental domains of the reflection group of the lattice i n and um, remember this is the thing with cox to, with with dinkin diagram b n and we can just pick the simple roots as follows we have minus one naught naught um, 1 minus 1 naught and all the way up to naught naught 1 minus 1 and as you remember this gives us a um, Dinkin diagram that looks something like this so the, the step naught of Vinberg's algorithm we just get the BN Dinkin diagram and then um, let's start with n equals 2 well, for n equals 2, we only get one extra root, which is this one here. And uh, this is norm 1. And the Dinkin diagram we get looks like this. So um, um, here uh, you notice that we've got the bn Dinkin diagram and we've got one extra root so, so so this is the extra root here so if we go back to Vinberg's paper you can see that this is the first of these mysterious diagrams he had um, now let's try n equals three well um, in this case the root we found here actually dies off and instead we get this root here, um, which now has norm 2. And the Dinkin diagram we get now looks like this. First of all, we get the um, this bit here, which you notice, of course, is just the B3 diagram. And then we get one new vector, which looks like this. Um, I think there should probably be an arrow on it. Um, and this vector actually turns out to be stable in the following sense, that as we increase n, we just keep it. We, we, we always get a simple root that looks like this. So um, sometimes simple roots kind of get killed off. 
and sometimes they they turn out to be stable and, and you keep them for all n. In fact, this in fact it wasn't really killed off. This root kind of turns into this root in some sense as you increase n from two to three. So what this means is um, the Dinkin diagram is always going to look a bit like this. There'll be something going on there, and we will get we we'll always get a piece that looks like this from B n, and we always get this one extra root here. Um, so, um, and for a while, um, that's all that happens. Um, again, if you look at Lindbergh's paper, you can see that for um, the next few values of it here, here's five less than or equal to n, less than or equal to nine, and nothing much new happens. Um, however, um, when you get to n equals 10, um, something changes. This time you get a new root, which looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's very easy to lose track of how many of these we've got. 3. Now you see this is norm 1, because we have 10 times 1 minus 3 squared, which is 1. Um, and this means the Dinkin diagram now looks like this. Um, Um, I hope I've got the right number of bits on them. Um, so we, we, we now get an extra root here. So, so this, this was the root with three ones in it that we had before. And there's an interesting new phenomenon we have here is that the number of simple roots is greater than the dimension. And this means in particular that these roots are not linearly independent. So uh, up until now, all, all, all the roots were linearly independent, as, as happens for spherical reflection groups. But now we've got this new phenomenon. Um, so for n less than 10, the, the fundamental domain is in some sense some sort of simplex. Um, but from now on, the fundamental domain starts to be more complicated. Um, and again, this root turns out to be... Um, um, not quite stable, but if we go to n equals 11, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 3. And this is now stable. Uh, we retain it in all bigger dimensions. So for n equals 12 and 13, nothing much new happens. We, we, we get a diagram that looks a bit like that. And um, for n equals 14, we get yet another new root, which looks like this. And I'm going to put some dots here because I'm going to lose track of how many ones I've got. So now um, we have a root that sort of has a four here. And this is norm one. And if we look at its Dinkin diagram, which I'm just going to um, use Vinberg's paper for because um, I get it wrong otherwise. Um, so here's the diagram for I14 one. We notice that we've got this extra phenomenon that the Dinkin diagram now has a symmetry of order two because we can just flip it like that. So let's say there's um, the Dinkin diagram has symmetry. Um, and from now on, the symmetry tends to increase. As you make n bigger and bigger, we, 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 we usually get more and more symmetries of the Dinkin diagram. And this goes on up to n equals 17. So here's this diagram for n equals 16. And you see this time the symmetry group now has, has gone up to order 4. And here, if you look rather carefully, you see the symmetry has gone up to order, order 8, I think. Um, and at n equals 18, Binberg and Kaplinskaya gave up doing it by hand because the number of roots starts to increase rather rapidly and used a computer. Um, so for n equals 18 and 19, um, there's the following interesting new phenomenon. Um, at about this point, the, the, the Dinkin diagram is almost transitive on simple roots. It's not transitive. On, on the simple roots, these are the roots of the um, Dinkin diagram for two reasons. 
Um, first of all, some roots of norm 1 and some roots of norm 2. Now, this is the obvious reason why it can't be transitive on them. The, the roots may have different norms. There's a second more subtle reason. The roots may be parity vectors. And this phenomenon is going to turn up a little bit later in, in, in some of the later lectures. So I'll explain what this is. So a parity vector is a vector R such that Rv is congruent to V squared, so Vv, mod 2 for all vectors V. So an example of a parity vector is just a vector that's all ones. Um, or, or, or more generally, if all the entries are odd, then you can see that R has this um, condition here. Now we want R to be have norm 1 or 2. So suppose we take R to be this vector here. So I'm going to have a lot of 1s and then a 3, uh, sorry, and then a 3 here and then a 5 here. Um, so this is norm 1 if... Um, um, there are 17 ones here. So R squared equals 1. Now, if we want all the things to be odd here and we want the norm to be 1, this can only happen if N is congruent to 2 modulo 8. Because, you know, in, if, 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 an odd, if, N, if, if a number is odd, then its square is always 1 mod 8. So there's a, there's a modulo 8 condition. Um, occurring here. So if, if we want roots, norm 1 roots that are parity vectors, then n has to be congruent to 2 mod 8. Similarly, if r squared equals 2, then this corresponds to n being congruent to 3 modulo 8. And you notice that 18 and 19 are congruent to 2 and 3 mod 8. So for these two values of dimension, we sort of unexpectedly get two sorts of simple roots of norm 1 or two sorts of simple roots of norm 2. Um, now we get to n equals 20. And this is where there's a really big change in the behaviour. Um, here, it turns out there are an infinite number of simple roots. So Vinberg's algorithm kind of breaks down. Well, well it doesn't break down. It, 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 go, it just goes on forever. I mean, it, it will find all the roots, but it will just take an infinite amount of time to do so. Um, furthermore, the symmetry group of the Dinkin diagram is infinite. Um, so... Um, I, I'm going to give several explanations of, of why um, things change so much at n equals 20. Uh, let's first of all give Vinberg's explanation. So Vinberg's explanation for why this happens is there are lattices in dimension 19 um, with determinant equal to 1 such that the root system, let's call this lattice L, has rank less than the rank of L. And there are two such lattices. And the root systems have, have, uh, have Dinkin diagrams um, A11, D7, and E6 cubed. So these root systems have rank 18, but the lattices themselves have ranked 19. So they're unimodular lattices whose vector space is not actually spanned by their roots. And Vinberg showed that whenever you get a lattice with this property, then it causes an infinite symmetry of the Dinkin diagram. Roughly speaking, if you take the lattice modulo the root lattice, then this tends to act on the Dinkin diagram of the, of the corresponding um, um, reflection group. And the point is, if you've got a lattice L, um, then um, um, you find that L is actually equal to omega bar modulo omega for some omega squared 
equal for some norm zero vector in I um, 19 um, sorry I 21 so this is this is going to be a 19 dimensional lattice and by sort of staring at this you can see that the lattice modulo the root lattice actually acts as symmetries fixing this vector w so if this if this group is infinite then the, the then the then the Dinkin diagram turns out to be infinite um so so that's as far as Vinberg went in for the odd unimodular lattices he worked out the Dinkin diagrams up to 19 and showed that in dimension above 19 the Dinkin diagram actually becomes infinite um, he also did the case of even lattices so we have i91 and ii171 and i guess ii251 so, so let's look at these three lattices well for this lattice um, what we do is um, we can write this as e8 plus this uh, little two-dimensional hyperbolic lattice with inner products like that and that means if we start Vinberg's algorithm, we start off with the Dinkin diagram of E8. Just as for the odd lattice, we start off with the Dinkin diagram of uh, Bn. And in fact, we get not only E8, but if you think about it, you, you, we, we, we actually get an E9. So, so this is the E9 Dinkin diagram of, of the um, Euclidean reflection group and then if we apply Vinberg's algorithm we find there's just one extra vector which is this point here and here this is for obvious reasons this is usually called the E10 Dinkin diagram and then Vinberg showed that that's the only extra root you get so this is this is Vinberg's Dinkin diagram for for this lattice now for the <coughs> um, 18 dimensional lattice something rather similar happens except we start with um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We start with two copies of E8 because we can write this lattice as E8 squared plus 0, 1, 1, minus 1. So as before, we get affine E8 squared. And then there's one extra point here. Um, and... Um, now, um, if we look at this diagram here, we can see several rather interesting things in it. In particular, we can see all the even unimodular lattices of dimension 16. So one even unimodular lattice of dimension 16 is E8 squared. And we see there's the affine Dinkin diagram of E8 squared, if I put my finger over that. But there's a second even unimodular lattice of dimension 16. And we can see it if I put my finger over these two vertices here. And if you look at this, you will see it's actually the, the um, affine E16 um, Dinkin diagram. You remember the affine D16 I find dn Dinkin diagram looks like this. So what we can uh, and so so in fact the affine um, Dinkin diagram of any even unimodular lattice of the right dimension is actually contained in the Dinkin diagram of this Lorentzian lattice. Um, by the way, the same thing works for odd lattices, and you may think, well, you can now classify uh, unimodular lattices just by writing down these Dinkin diagrams and spotting affine Dinkin diagrams inside this. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work. The trouble is, except in a few cases like this, the, the, the Dinkin diagram just turns out to be too complicated. I mean, I mean, as we saw before, it's actually infinite. So good luck writing it down and trying to find all the affine Dinkin diagrams inside it. Um, and in this case here, Vinberg showed that the Dinkin diagram is infinite. Um, well, for odd lattices, Vinberg showed the diagram is infinite by finding a unimodular lattice whose root system is a smaller smaller rank than that of the lattice. And in 25 di 24 dimensions, there's a very famous lattice with this property called the Leech lattice. It's unimodular. And it has no roots at all. 
So in particular, the rank of the root system is less than the rank of the lattice um, in a rather drastic way. The rank of the root system is actually zero. So um, for the E8, for, for, for the, this root system, we, we can do carry out um, Vinberg's algorithm just as before. And in fact, we, we get the same thing as before. So we get um, a copy, three copies of E8 and an extra point here, but we get lots of other points as well. In fact, an infinite number of them. Um, so um, that's the um, uh, summary of Vinberg's paper. He calculated all the Dinkin diagrams of the reflection groups of unimodular Lorentzian lattices uh, in the cases when they were all finite. Uh, so the next lecture I'm going to talk about Conway's work on this um, lattice here. So, so Vinberg showed the the reflection group was infinite and Conway came up with this absolutely spectacular calculation where he actually managed to work out what the Dinkin diagram of this is and it turns out to be more or less the Leech lattice.